How's it going, everybody? Doing well? Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, hopefully you made it here, you know, without any dents or scratches. I know uh, the wind has been kind of insane today, so uh, appreciate you being here. I know there's a, plenty of things you could be doing with your Tuesday evening, and uh, we really appreciate you having or coming out here. So um, I, I think we have a p few people on the live stream, too. So if you weren't already aware, that is an option. Uh, if you can't make it out some nights, uh, we like to provide that for, for anybody who has other obligations and needs to be at home. So um, welcome uh, to React Denver. Uh, just a, a couple quick housekeeping bits. Kevin, if you could just advance the slides here. Um, we have food and beverage down here. So if you didn't already get that, feel free. Just help yourself, uh, e even during the talks, if you can be discreet about it. But uh, feel free to, to grab some. Um, Restrooms are right across the hall, and then there are also some others, some gender-specific uh, restrooms around the elevators, so um, feel free, uh, help yourself there, and I think that's pretty much it. Next slide. Um, just a few words on our sponsors tonight. SALT is again sponsoring the meetup tonight, thanks to them, and also to Turing and Granicus. Uh, I work for SALT, so I'm going to take a, a quick moment to plug it. Um, we are hiring, and we are uh, a blockchain-specific company, so if that interests you at all, um, I know it's, it's been kind of a, a buzzword as of late, uh, for better or worse, but we're, we are really doing some awesome things in the space, and if you pay attention to us, or to blockchain at all, maybe you've heard about it, uh, I really recommend uh, coming up and, and talking to me about it, or checking out our website, where you can find out a lot more information there, so... Um, also, like I said, Turing and Granicus. Turing's been absolutely wonderful with this space, and they've been uh, very accommodating to us. So thanks to them, and Granicus is a longtime sponsor, so we can't thank them enough. Uh, wanted to give an opportunity uh, for anybody else who's hiring. I've already done my bit, so uh, is there anybody who wants to make a hiring announcement at the moment? Yeah. And what's the company? Oh, uh, I see. Okay, okay. So people should come talk to you. <laughs> okay, cool. Anybody else? Nope. All right. Well, um, feel free to write your name up here later. Uh, we will have an intermission between talks, so you will have an opportunity uh, to do that. So. Um, next, we have some announcements. I wrote this one up here uh, just because it was a, a spiel. Will Klein was not able to make it tonight. He had some obligations, but uh, he's giving a talk at the Boulder React meetup. Uh, I believe it's, yeah, this upcoming Monday. Um, you'll have to double check their meetup page for that. I didn't have time to confirm today, but uh, feel free to, uh, to check them out. I know they have some great talks, and, and as that says up there, Will's going to be giving a talk on Create React App. There's also going to be some uh, talks on Git specifically, so um, check that out. It, was there any other announcements? I just want to give anybody an opportunity to, you know, maybe plug something that's going on in the community or shout something out. Anybody? Cool. Well, with that, uh, we'll kick things off here, and I'll introduce Scott. Um, he is, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. Uh, he's the creator of Level Up Tutorials, and I'll allow him to introduce himself a little bit too, but... Uh, co-host of Syntax, very well known in the uh, web development education space, and so really pleased to have him here giving us a, a talk on some soft skills. So please give him a round of applause. Test. This might be a little hot. Yeah, a little hot. I don't know which one it is. Please talk, Scott. Test. Test. Ooh. Test. 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 Hello, hello, hello. Test. I think let's give another shot. Hello. 
Can, every, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool, okay, that works. Let me uh, get this air display. Uh, how do I take this over? I have selected AirPlay and it's, here we go. Decide to lose my window. Hold on. All right. Cool. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, if you want to follow along with these slides for any reason in particular, uh, they're at toofasttofurious.netlify.com. I was super lucky and got that domain before someone else snagged it. It was totally free. Uh, but yeah, so this talk is gonna be on learning. Uh, my name is Scott Talinsky. Uh, I'm a uh, teacher primarily of JavaScript, frameworks, CSS stuff, all sorts of web dev technologies. Uh, so this talk is really gonna be uh, about learning, but not like a scientific learning exploration of, of like learn X fast or whatever. This is gonna be some like six hard tips for uh, learning JavaScript web development topics things that are relevant to our industry, React stuff, uh, faster, more confidently, and a little bit more in depth. Uh, so despite the name of this talk, I'm not going to fill this thing with too fast, too furious GIFs. Uh, I, I won't be doing that. Does this still even working? Uh, just kidding. There's gonna be lots of fast and furious <laughs> GIFs. Um, let's see if this works. So, uh, all right, looks like I'm using Using this, so who am I? I am the creator of a website called Level Up Tutorials where I've made uh, a ton of web development tutorial topics, uh, videos primarily, uh, and uh, I've created over thousands of video tutorials on this YouTube channel. Uh, I've gained over 22 million views over the, the course of, since 2012, of doing these uh, uh, video tutorials. I also co-host the Syntax Podcast with Wes Boss, which is a full stack podcast. Um, we talk about all sorts of stuff from React to soft skills to business skills, uh, JavaScript specific, CSS specific, full stack stuff, uh, anything uh, node, backend, whatever. Uh, and I like to think it's, it's like a pretty fun podcast. We have a good time doing it. All right, uh, sorry, the slides are not in sync here. Might be the Apple thing, let's see. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk a little bit about like why I'm able to talk about uh, this kind of thing. Uh, if, for the first part, I've created over 2,000 some video tutorials on tons of different topics. Uh, like I said, from React, JavaScript, whatever. And a lot of times this stuff is like coming up brand new and I usually have to learn these things really quickly to be able to get them out before uh, well, before they're like not relevant anymore. You know, in this space, things are moving so quickly. Uh, so I've created over 2,000 plus video tutorials for all sorts of different platforms. Uh, again, I host the weekly podcast. In this podcast, uh, we have an hour long episode every single week where we have to talk about things. Uh, we have to sound smart <laughs> while we're talking about things. And we have to like know what we're talking about. In addition, we also have some what we call potluck episodes where uh, people can just ask a bunch of questions and uh, we gotta sound like we know what we're talking about. So it involves a lot of research and a lot of studying and a lot of learning in that regard. Um, in addition, I'm also completely obsessed with keeping my code base current. And by current, I mean like too current. Uh, I like ripped out my data layer, threw GraphQL in there, uh, threw Apollo in there. I, I was not satisfied with that. The new APIs came out, give me those render props this week. I'm doing that right now. So I'm like, almost like treading water on features for my site because I'm constantly reworking it. So uh, uh, that's like a, a personal personal thing there. It's not necessarily uh, uh, something that is super important, right? Okay, so uh, why does any of this matter, right? You're, you're maybe not a podcast host or a YouTube person. Like why do you have to learn uh, things quickly? Wh why does that matter? Uh, well. In our industry, sorry, I have to keep 
clicking back and forth here is, there we go. Uh, in our industry, there is basically a thousand new JavaScript frameworks every week. Uh, something, somebody's coming out with something totally new. You've never seen this thing, and uh, maybe it's not the next biggest thing, right? But maybe it is React, or maybe it is Angular, or whatever. And this thing came out, and all of a sudden it's picking up speed, picking up steam, and all of a sudden, job posts, right? Uh, so basically, you start looking, and the platforms are evolving, and the job posts start coming in, and you start seeing less backbone job posts, and less uh, things, you know, backbone, marionette, whatever, or less this or that, and then all of a sudden you start seeing more React, or now you're probably seeing a little bit more Vue than you were seeing a couple months ago. And so, uh, these things are always evolving, and if you want to be getting work, you have to be evolving too, or else uh, you run the risk of getting left behind and your, your pay could decrease or you could lose your job at some point and not be able to, to catch up. So being able to learn quickly is good to just have a head in the industry of where it's going, where it's moving. Uh, and also, I mean, web development is constantly becoming more than HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. We all know this. We're building applications with full stack, isomorphic React and everything, right? We're, we're building these front end, back end stuff in more bigger ways than we've ever been doing before, right? Uh, and lastly, the new shiny things aren't always worthless because at some point, React was a new shiny thing and that people thought it was, you know, oh, what is this? It's, it's maybe, uh, I guess it had Facebook's push behind it, but literally anything that's come out could have been looked at as like this, this shiny new thing that, oh, well, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not anything important just yet. Uh, but each time something new comes out, whether that's just now GraphQL is, is you know, picking up steam, right? You're getting an evolution and things are growing in, in a way that's uh, both progressing our industry, uh, but also progressing how you think about building your stuff. And it's maybe making your code easier. I'm gonna tell you that like, since I've moved to Apollo GraphQL, uh, my stack is like the, the most fun it's ever been to work in. And just because it's a new and shiny and it's brand new or this or that, like doesn't mean it's uh, something that you don't need to focus on right now. It could be this paradigm shift, like React was a paradigm shift, to get you thinking in totally different ways. Okay, uh, so through the rest of the course of this talk, Oh no, let's go back, there we go. I'm gonna be doing six steps uh, to enhance your learning skills in different ways. Some of these are gonna be a little bit more hands-on. Some of these are ones that you're gonna have to do a little bit of exploration yourself. But these are gonna be six like actionable things that you can spend time on, okay? Uh, so uh, the first of which is going to require you to do a bit of exploration. And uh, as this GIF has its, uh, it's both an internal and an external exploration. You're going to be needing to look into how you learn as well as what things help you learn. Okay, so first is your learning style. Uh, so basically, your learning style, a lot of people think that you can learn easily through all the same types of things, right? Uh, for instance, I, I, I have a YouTube channel and I'll post videos, uh, and then you'll see a comment come in that's like, learning from videos is, is, is impossible, it's dumb. Uh, I would prefer to learn from a blog post. You should make this into a blog post. And, and that's cool, uh, I, that's cool too. I mean, uh, but everyone has their own learning styles. For instance, uh, my wife is a, a doctor of uh, psychology, so, I have my psychological profile to tell me that I have terrible working memory, like some of the worst working memory. In fact, uh, it's so bad that it invalidates my IQ test. It's like, it plummets it off the, the test and it totally ruins the test. So I, I can't even get an IQ because of my memory. So because of that, I'm a terrible reader. Uh, and so blog posts specifically are really bad for me. Uh, I can read, I'll just get lost in the paragraph. And, and a lot of people that can happen. Uh, that's why I prefer audiobooks, right? But other people, they really like to read a long blog post. They can sit, they can focus, they can get all that information, take it in and go to town. Other people really like to view the source. And I think that like, that can really come the more and more you understand a technology. Uh, you can just paw through the source and instantly know what's, what's there, right? 
Uh, and other people like the documentation. Other people like YouTube channels. I personally, I learn best from learning big concepts from YouTube channels where I can hear somebody explain metaphors and, and things like that for big topics. But I also learn really well from looking at the documentation. And then if I really want to get into it, I can look at the source. But I usually go uh, uh, documentation first and then head in code and start working. So this is going to be something that's going to be very, very personal to you, right? Uh, Nobody can tell you what you're good at, but you do want to pay attention specifically to what's working, what's not working for you. If you notice your eyes glossing over at a blog post, don't force yourself to read 100 blog posts because it's not going to get any easier. Uh, so again, this is a personal exploration that you're going to need to do. Next is another personal exploration, but this time of learning resources. There's a billion learning resources online, if, uh, from Level Up tutorials to uh, West Boss tutorials to Team Treehouse to uh, blog posts that you like. Uh, all, there's a billion different blog networks, right? If you find a particular content creator, like pay attention to the author of that blog. Uh, pay attention to who's writing that stuff and follow those people on Twitter, follow them and, and read all their stuff because chances are they have something that they're just connecting with you. Like I speak very metaphorically when I teach. I, I, I talk in a lot of big concepts or even simple concepts sometimes. And people who really like really fine details, they don't like my work as much. And that's okay because there's going to be other people that can do that. So uh, you're going to want to find your preferred learning resources and just stick with those. And you'll branch out, you'll find new ones or whatever, but really hold on to those ones that work well for you. Okay. Uh, so the next step here is going to be to build your foundation. Uh, this is a pretty sweet movie. Uh, this is Airborne from Disney. Um, Oh wait, yeah, we gotta get these. Uh, there's some uh, some kids in here cheering them on. <laughs> um, yeah. So okay. Yeah, there they are. Okay, I had, I had to get that. So uh, again, so this part is really all about uh, the stuff that's going to make your life easier. Learning uh, new platforms, specifically XYZ JavaScript framework comes out. Well, do I have to start at the beginning? Well, the, the best part about uh, fundamentals or the foundation, your basics, is that uh, they go a long ways. You can take them with you from framework to framework. And even though Vue.js and Angular and React are all very different in large amount of ways, they're still just JavaScript. Right? It's, it's just JavaScript, and you have good core foundational JavaScript skills. You can take those with you from project to project to project, and learning that framework is going to be a matter of learning the syntax for that framework rather than any sort of core JavaScript skills. So this core JavaScript, uh, CSS, and JavaScript, all that core programming fundament, uh, fundamentals, foundational skills, are going to be really important to spend a lot of time on. Uh, we always used to say, uh, without a strong foundation, your house will collapse. Uh, and that's like really true. You just want to build those skills. Uh, and lastly, it, one of the cool things about your foundational skills is that you can improve them regardless of what project you're working on. You can write a React app and really focus on your core JavaScript skills while you're writing uh, that application. You don't have to uh, make it, now it's time to learn JavaScript. I mean, if you're working in a JavaScript platform, all of the time is the time to be learning JavaScript. Okay, yeah, the next, again, this goes along with the same thing, is you're gonna want to use native things, okay? Uh, I, I'll never forget, I had a comment, or I don't even wanna say comment, because I probably had multiple comments that illustrate this same kind of idea here. Uh, but people who are learning React, who come from Angular or they come from something else, and they say, well, that's really weird how React uses uh, some, that React.map thing to do uh, looping over stuff, and you're just like, Bro, that's JavaScript. That's that. This is outputting array. You just have an array there, and uh, that's there's nothing special about dot map, right? It's not a a React API. That is a core JavaScript thing. And so that to me was like pretty eye opening. That people just don't they learn this platform and they put their head into it and they say, oh, okay, so to loop I do a dot map, but they don't understand why they're doing it. So uh, having these native skills of this native JavaScript stuff that you're going to be using in the project is going to save you from confusing 
what is the framework and what is JavaScript, okay? So uh, again, frameworks are always going to matter less when your JavaScript skills are strong. I can't iterate that enough. Um, and the next is going to be a nice little tip here. Uh, when it makes sense, use native libraries wherever over platform libraries. Uh, there's exceptions for big things like React Router, right? Obviously, you're not gonna use some JavaScript routing solution that is uh, not React specific when React Router is so great in React. But if you're gonna be, let's say, uh, an example might be like cookies. You're gonna use a, a cookie library. Well, there are a ton of React cookie libraries that do nothing other than set and retrieve a cookie. But why use a React cookie library when you could use a JavaScript cookie library that you could take with you from project to project, you only learn the API once, you only learn how it works once, and then it doesn't matter which project you learn or not. You're not learning a React specific skill, you're learning a JavaScript skill that you could take, 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 and, and move along, regardless of what framework. Uh, and so and the, another like, really good part about that is typically these libraries are much, are much more supported, they have a much larger community behind them, because it's not the React community or whatever, it's the JavaScript community as a whole. Because of that, they're uh, worked on more, they have a bigger community, they'll see updates and stuff like that. Um, okay, so the next step on the list is going to be to narrow your focus. Uh, this is one of my favorite GIFs here, I think, in this thing. Okay, so, uh, Part of the narrowing your focus is relying on context when you're learning. Chances are you, you put your hand to your code and you start working and you start exploring and you don't sort of think about this uh, inherent context of, of where these things are being filed in your brain. You just think, hey, I'm learning this stuff and I'm gonna build this stuff. Uh, but um, if you are trying to learn five things at once, uh, you won't have the proper context uh, for the concepts you're learning. For instance, if you are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna learn React. Uh, you don't want to learn React plus Redux plus Apollo plus uh, Webpack plus this and that all at the same time because what does what, it, it, you start to realize I don't know exactly uh, what's responsibility is what. And suddenly when you learn the system, you're learning the system as a whole instead of these pieces. Uh, so what you want to do is narrow your focus to learn React, React's core APIs. Then learn React plus Redux. Then learn React plus Apollo. Then learn React plus this. And if you do that, you start to uh, really uh, separate these different areas uh, of what you're learning and they're sort of filed away. So that way when you go to learn React plus Apollo, you don't have to learn React plus Apollo from scratch, you just have to learn Apollo, right, and how it connects to React. Uh, so that is a really important part is you don't wanna blur these boundaries. You wanna keep separate boundaries so you totally know uh, what's what at all times. And again, this is going along with this. Uh, when you do uh, decide to learn a platform as a whole, when you go to learn something else, everything is going to be slower. So. Uh, if you've learned this chunk of this whole thing, you're now carrying around this whole chunk as a big separate thing, and you gotta go pick up another big separate chunk of this other thing. Uh, and it's gonna take a lot longer because now again, you have to learn a whole nother set of platforms instead of one small platform and how it relates. Okay, so step four is to promote, promote excitement. Um, I'm gonna let this guy go for a second. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty sweet. Um, let's see, yeah, this guy's pretty excited. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so, okay. Part of this is uh, we want to, I don't know, it, I don't know if you remember when you first started programming, right? Like when you first, first started programming or even when you first started learning something new, there was this moment where you didn't wanna do anything but look at your computer, you had this total tunnel vision, you're just like type, 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 it was like a hacker movie and you were just going to town, right? Uh, and, and that feeling of, of, of excitement and everything that happens, it comes along with this like new fresh project is, is when you're, you're brand new to coding. So that feeling is one of the most powerful feelings for learning anything. Uh, it, you really just, you have to get to that place and you have to get to that mindset. So you wanna be really thinking about how does that feel? 
How did that feel to be so excited about anything? Um, and part of that uh, is after you do get that excitement, uh, you end up into this, this flow mode. Like I mentioned, you, you, you tunnel vision, you get going and you start working. Before you know it, it's 5 a.m. and you haven't slept and you can't go to sleep because you're too excited about some stupid API that is gonna be there tomorrow anyways, right? Um, so this flow moment is a perfect moment for really learning a ton of stuff. You just, you soak up everything in this moment and you end up getting a ton done. And so, uh, the last point is here is how do you get this excitement? How do, you, how do you feel this excitement about stuff you're learning? And one of the things that I always think kills excitement about stuff you're learning is picking a project that's either work-based, like you have to get this done with a deadline that's got a client, or uh, you're picking something that you just don't care about. Some tutorial told you to make uh, a movie database, that's what I do in my tutorials, and you don't care about movies. So you're just like, I'm not gonna do this. Like that doesn't make you super excited. So one of my favorite things to get excited about my projects is if I'm following a tutorial, I'm reading a blog, following the docs, I pick up something that already excites me and I attach it to it. So uh, I do a lot of, I watch 1970s kung fu movies, I break dance, uh, I go snowboarding, I have a lot of hobbies, right? And so all of those hobbies have an opportunity for me to attach something cool to it, right? I wanted to learn Ruby on Rails, I made a project that allowed me to categorize my breakdancing moves so that when I was in a battle or a competition, I could look at it on my phone and be like, all right, here's what I got. Uh, and that was really exciting. Like, that's why I learned Ruby on Rails, because I was just like, wow, okay, I gotta get this by Saturday because I got a competition coming up. Um, and so that really led to a lot of learning because uh, I was excited to learn about these technologies for more reasons than the technology or the code itself. Uh, so pick things that you care about Use your hobbies, attach the stuff that already excites you to the stuff that doesn't excite you to make it more exciting. Uh, and next, we get into the fun time, which is the grind time. Uh, it's pretty sweet too. Um, and so in grind time is the part where we gotta start working really hard. And uh, this is the part where you kinda have to check your ego uh, because Everyone looks at stuff and they think I, I'm smart, I'm this or that. And I'll tell you, man, I, like, if I had that mentality, I would not be you know, learning anything. I, in fact, you gotta check yourself all the time. I was pawing through some stuff today on my, my Twitter feed and there was like a blog post about render props and I was just like, I know render props. And then I clicked the article anyways, I was like, well, maybe I'll just read this. And it was so much good information in it that I would never have gotten and I was this close to avoiding it because I thought I knew, I thought I knew it. I thought I was, uh, I thought it was too cool. So uh, the moment that you realize that you're not, or the moment that you think you're too smart, you've already lost. So check your ego. Uh, you're not that smart. Get ready to learn. Um, and just get ready to be a student, right? Put yourself in that student mindset. Okay, so uh, next in grind time is uh, one of my favorite ones because everyone likes to focus on uh, quality, 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 quality. Uh, and if you're learning, I don't necessarily understand this because uh, iteration-driven development is one of my favorite things here. Uh, it's, it's where you, you care less and make more stuff. Like who cares if this project that you're making uh, for your breakdancing app or your kung fu app or whatever, who cares if that code's any good? You just need to start getting pen to paper and start putting stuff out. You just start to get your hands working and accomplishing stuff, collecting small wins, small wins, small wins, and let that drive your excitement. So again, like care less, make more stuff. That's it, code a lot more. Uh, and this is a point where you can just have fun and, and, and actually see some real results, right? And so uh, again, iteration, uh, but then the second part of that is iteration and refinement. So you iterate, you write a lot of code, you write a lot of code, you write a lot of code, then you go back and you look at that code and you say, huh, that sucks, uh, let me fix it. So then you fix it and then you learn and you learn a lot of really important lessons. Um, and there's that whole like Facebook, move fast and break things, is that a Facebook? I think it's a, a Facebook quote or whatever. And that, that's a, a terrible quote for production code, but like that's a great quote for, for learning stuff because if you move fast and break things, every time you break something, you have to solve a problem. And then chances are you're not gonna have that problem again because you've solved that problem, you've built that little uh, memory block up in your brain. Okay, so iteration-driven development. Write a lot of code. 
Next is going to be uh, another good one here, is use people that are smarter than you. Because there's a lot of people that are smarter than you. Uh, there's a lot of people that are smarter than everyone. So uh, like, there's always going to be that guy be like, well, actually, uh, your code sucks. Um, and that's cool. <laughs> it probably does. Um, so what we want to do uh, to use people that are smarter than us is two things. Uh, we want to find a good style guide. Uh, I don't know who in here has done Angular, Angular 1 in the past. Uh, I, when we first started learning Angular, it was right after it came out. There wasn't a ton of established best practices. It was sort of just the wild west of, oh, wow, you can do this? Let me just do this. And you're hacking together an app really quick. Um, I was working for Ford. We were building Ford.com. And it was, it was, we were just, uh, me and a couple of guys, we were just sort of like, oh, hey, do you know you could do this? Well, let's look through the docs. And the docs weren't even that good at this point until we found the John Papa style guide, which basically told you how to do everything. And not only told you how to do everything, but the best practices for how to do everything. And that thing totally blew our minds because suddenly we had a roadmap of where to go for everything. And it wasn't necessarily that this is the best way to do things, but this was a, a styled, organized manner that a lot of other people were doing. So chances are, if you were in a job interview and you were like, yeah, I followed the John Papa style guide, they were just like, cool, uh, that's, that's a, a big plus, okay? So uh, you want to be finding these style guides. Uh, and typically, you're going to want to look for the ones that are by somebody who's a core developer for the team. The Airbnb React one is obviously one a lot of people use. I use that, the ES lint rules for that setup myself. Um, and you're going to find these style guides. You're going to want to stick to them. Uh, stick to them really hard and uh, use them to learn a lot about the code. So, and the next one is going to be use snippet libraries, which might seem like it's cheating because you're not writing the code. Uh, and I say sponsored snippet libraries on here, but I really just mean popular ones. Typically, these popular ones are like if it's a TypeScript or I don't know, something it's written by Microsoft or whoever, right? Like, you're going to want to find these ones that have the most stars, but are also, uh, you know, backed by something. If it's the John Papa style guide, you're going to look for the John Papa uh, sponsored snippet library sort of thing, the Air Airbnb React snippet library or whoever, right? So these snippet libraries, uh, again, it might seem like it's, it's cheating because you're not writing the code. Your fingers aren't typing these patterns. But it's exposure to good practices, and it's exposure to clean code, and it's exposure to how everything should look. And the more you see it, the more you're going to be thinking that way, because all of a sudden, that's how you're familiar with how this render prop whatever looks, because you've seen it 100 times. And maybe you didn't type it, but you're seeing it. So use people that are smarter than you, because yeah, that'll, that'll help out a ton with your code quality. Oh, this is a good one, too. Uh, Robocop comes to the TV here, and he grabs a uh, chicken finger. <laughs> yeah, so he's pretty psyched. Um, yeah. So this is total immersion. This is the best step of all, in my opinion, because it's the one where you have to do the least, really. Uh, it's also my They Live movie slide, this consume thing. Uh, but, okay, so we have, uh, this is the part where you get to like not do coding or not do reading. This is the part where you get to have everything just sort of permeate into you. And what I mean is by uh, find a podcast, follow YouTube videos, follow blogs, follow, jump in a Slack group, follow prominent people on Twitter, uh, do all of those things even if you cannot focus on them. Because trust me, at this point, you cannot focus on them. But I subscribe, uh, like if I want to learn about anything, it, like anything, I'll, I'll subscribe to like eight different podcasts on that topic. And I'll just have them play all day for a couple weeks. And eventually I'll get sick of it because you're, you're hearing the same things over and over again. But in that time, you're, you've learned so much stuff. Uh, there's podcasts for everything. There's a GraphQL specific podcast. There's a podcast for everything. Um, so uh, you're going to want to, uh, again, make this stuff so it's effortless. You don't want to have to hunt out these blogs. You're going to subscribe and follow them wherever you actually check your stuff, and so it just sinks into your brain. So at this point, it's almost just like, it's like brainwashing. You're sitting there, you're, the stuff is, is coming into your brain. Um, and, and that's really just it. Uh, you just need to absolutely surround yourself with the topic until you're sick of it. Um, but that's, that's it. Uh, those are the six steps, in my opinion, for being uh, faster at learning this web programming stuff. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, any one given tip here, um, 
may not apply to you, or, or you might think, I already do this or this or this. But uh, hopefully, one or, or two of these things uh, sunk into a little bit and is like, oh, hey, I'm not doing that. And maybe that can, can help me uh, learn X, Y, Z faster for my next job interview. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to leave you with a quote here from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, if you're not first, you're last. Uh, <laughs> so you got to go fast. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at S. Tolinsky. Uh, S. Tolinsky, if you want to see some sick breakdancing videos, or at Level Up Tuts, if you want to see photos of my dog. Uh, <laughs> leveluptutorials.com for all of my tutorial videos. I teach GraphQL stuff. I teach React. I have a new course on Vue. I have a new course on headless WordPress coming up. Uh, and uh, Level Up Tutorials YouTube has a ton of free content, like thousands of free videos. And if you are looking for a new podcast, check out syntax.fm. Uh, we release every Wednesday. Tomorrow we have an episode coming out that is what we're calling a potluck, where everyone submits a bunch of questions, we get to answer them, and we talk about uh, a host of a variety of different things, uh, headless WordPress amongst those things. So yeah, if you, you like my content, uh, subscribe or buy my tutorials, that'd be sweet. I'd be pretty psyched about that because I do this for a living. And uh, yeah, thank you. I, can, I don't know if there's time, but I can do questions Absolutely, or yeah. uh, on podcast or YouTube or learning or whatever. Whatever. If yeah, there's any questions any. for Scott. Cool. Oh. I have a, I have a working memory of fear. So you said you like to read docs and posts. I like to read docs because it typically, uh, blog posts, they end up getting lost in this big chunk of text, right? But typically docs are like, here's a sentence, here's some code. Here's a sentence, here's some code. And a lot of times I'll glance over that sentence and <laughs> maybe sometimes that's my downfall because it's like, warning, don't do this thing that we're showing you below, not do this thing. And I'll do that thing and the whole thing will break. Uh, but I like it because it gets you into the code a lot. And, and one of my things is just copying and pasting, throwing in and seeing results right away. So uh, that's why I like docs. I'm a, a uh, I don't know, I have a, a thing for really well-written docs. When I encounter really well-written docs, I like instantly want to use that project more. Uh, so uh, that's a, a, a big thing for me personally. How do you give less of a shit? How do you give less of a shit? <laughs> uh, like, the, it, the, that's part of going along with picking projects that are not mission critical. Uh, if it's not mission critical, you're not getting paid to do it, it's, it's just for fun, it's way easier to not give a shit about it. Like, uh, if, if I'm typing some code and like I just want to see this thing work, I'll be like, background green, who cares that it's this ugly green color? But you know, text color yellow, whatever. I mean, I care, you don't care at all because you're just, you're trying to get results. But to me, that's like a, a big important part is to not pick things that you really care about uh, when you're trying to learn fast. If you're trying to uh, build something really cool, eh, maybe give more shits. Yeah. So is that just something you don't care at all about? Is that the same difference you care a lot about? Or? No, I mean, well, you want to care about it, <laughs> but you don't want it to be like, <laughs> you don't want it to, uh, um, to like care to the point where, hey, if this thing doesn't work, I'm not going to have you know, 10 bucks to ride the bus home or something like that. Uh, it, it has to be coming from a place of excitement care about it, an interest care about it, rather than a place of uh, this, this, this is what I do to make a living care about it. Yeah, the turn's outrageous. Um, there, there's a couple of different things for this. I, it's uh, tough to say. When I first started learning uh, JavaScript front-end frameworks, I did a tour, a mini tour. I picked, at the time it was Ember, Backbone, and Angular 1 when it was in its infancy. And I used each of them for one week, and I just decided to build a to-do list app, right? which is the most basic example you're ever given. I'm going to use each of these one time, and I'm just going to say, hey, which one of these made me feel the least worst? Like, which one of these like, made me actually want to come back to it? And at the time, it was Angular because it was so easy. right? And it just so happened that a lot of people felt that way, so it started picking up a lot of momentum. 
uh, a lot of times now, I do wait a little bit. Um, Vue was picking up a lot of steam, and it was only until very recently that I decided, okay, you know, I'm gonna dive into Vue. Uh, but I'm really invested in React. My whole platform's in React. I code in React every day. Um, so what if I really like Vue? Like, I'm gonna be tempted to rewrite all my stuff in Vue? I don't want that. Uh, but I bit the bullet and learned it because I wanted to experiment with it. And again, I didn't take a long time. I, I took a little small to-do list project, and I just took a little weekend here or there to try it out. And I liked it. I liked it enough that I wanted to make a whole tutorial series out of it. Uh, I didn't like it enough that I wanted to rewrite my site in it, but I liked it enough. Um, but to know if something's going to be around longer the next week or the week after than that, a lot of it has to do with who's behind it, the companies that are backing it, the people that are supporting it, and generally what the community outlook looks like. I mean, when Angular 2 came out and so many people were pissed off about it, I think you sort of knew that uh, People were going to start looking for something else just because of that that community, the way people were speaking out about uh, how they didn't like the the new syntax changes or something like that. Um, so for me, I, I I follow a lot of trusted developers, but I don't listen to everything they say. I sort of take an aggregate of what all these people are saying and what people are using in production. Uh, it's 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 honestly really tough because again, there's just so much new stuff out there uh, that picking one thing and betting on it and betting wrong is really costly. Uh, my site is in Meteor, which is actually a pretty sweet pl platform for a lot of reasons, but I'm like hardly using any Meteor, so I'm using Meteor as a build tool, like specifically right now. My whole API is in, in Apollo. Uh, so, uh, but as a build tool, it's pretty sweet. Uh, but I, I kind of bet wrong on that one because not a ton of people are using me. I mean, people are using it, but not a ton of people are using it. It didn't like really get that momentum that they may have thought it would have had. Uh, and I'm paying for it. Eh, I, I guess sometimes you guess, guess right, sometimes you guess wrong. And um, so GraphQL is still young. Yeah, GraphQL is still young. But there's a lot of really uh, important people and there's a lot of important people using it in production on uh, like projects that are and they're really passionate about it. The people who talk about it, talk about it very passionately. Um, and, and the fact that it, it powers live production Facebook uh, is, is pretty, uh, uh, it gives them a lot of clout. It gives them a lot of, of backing, right? Well, here's something you can tell. Like with GraphQL, we're using it with Vue and React. Yeah. And, you know, because I've had the back end experience, when I saw GraphQL, I'm like, okay, this is a winner. Yeah. Because at the last company that I started, the REST API was a mess. Yeah. And this solves a huge chunk of the problems of REST. So to me, that's obvious that that's a winner. It would be funny if maybe I lacked experience, but it's like, okay, I like Vue, I like REST. So the GPA is still a little bit better, but does it really work? So in that case, I would pick what's ever attached to it, right? You like Relay, you like that, and I'll attach React. It's, you know, it's all Facebook. Oh, they did. I don't know much about Relay, to be honest, other than that it exists. And two weeks old. You look at it, I'm like, I don't know how to use it. It's two weeks old. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's tough. I don't know. There's, there's no hard and fast rules to it. because, uh, uh, But again, it, you can always wait a little bit longer, but then you might be waiting forever. Like, I don't use any sort of type checking right now because, like, uh, well, I was like, oh, I'll just sit and watch, you know, TypeScript and uh, is it Flow and Reason battle it out to the death. And, like, it's still, like, I don't know, maybe TypeScript is winning or whatever. But, like, I don't have an answer to that one yet, so I haven't picked one, and I'm still waiting. So uh, you could be waiting forever, like, that skeleton you know, at the picnic table image. On the TypeScript letter, this is a big one. We pick TypeScript, but they're both pretty good. Yeah, so yeah. Way better than just playing Java. I know, I, I know. We, we just talked about this on the podcast today. We were like, yeah, <laughs> we got to do it. Uh-oh. <laughs> we have another question over here. Yo. Uh, so how long are your immersion sessions? Is this like a week or oh. like a, a day range? Or <laughs> yeah. Generally. Generally, you know. It's, it's changed so much for me. So uh, my wife was getting her doctorate, so like she was head in the books, and I could just be like, you know what, I'm coding from 8, eight to you know, 2 a.m. or whatever, like all day long, because she had nothing to do with stuff. Um, but now, I know I had this stuff in my pocket here. Let's see. Yeah, now, I, I have a, a 10 month old, okay? Uh, and uh, <laughs> I don't have as much time. So these sessions have to be, for me, during work hours. And I do nine to five or whatever, but I'll, I'll make it no longer than like a week. Uh, because what I'm doing is, it's a little bit different for me because I'm teaching 
full time. So I can take a, a week out of my, my schedule and it's still productive because it's going to a tutorial series that I'm working on or something like that. But typically, if, if I was working at a job, I would uh, talk to my boss, I, I've done this a few times, and I would just say, hey, I wanna build this internal tool. Maybe it's a, a, a pre-deploy checklist that we have to use. And he'll be like, that sounds sweet. And I'll be like, okay, can I get this many hours a week to work on it? Sure, okay. And then I'll spend that time uh, as my immersion time while I'm at work getting that stuff done. Uh, so th there's little things you can do here and there. Uh, I, I tend to now try to keep it in the business hours rather than doing these late night, all night long things, but you know. Yeah. Cool. Is that it? Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Cool. We'll take a uh, quick five and we'll be back uh, for dance talk. So. If you need to hit the restroom or grab some more food, I don't know if there's any left, but feel free to check it out.
going to get going again here. Big thanks to Scott. That was a terrific talk. Um, and just want to uh, introduce our next speaker here, continuing with the very epic uh, talk titles here. We, Dan Levy's joining us from Galvanize. I'll let him introduce himself a little bit, but please do give him a warm welcome. Hi, thank you uh, all for attending. Uh, this is uh, super exciting. Uh, this talk is Heroic Refactoring for Mortals. And this is one of those topics that many, many pages have been, uh, have been written on. And many blogs, many talks, many podcasts. Uh, and they're all great, often great. Um, but you know, there's, it's hard to come up with steps that are useful and actionable that you can take and implement at work or on your own code. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, it, it is flickering. It's, it's OK. I just thought my brain was doing something. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, so. OK. Um, OK, I thought you were trolling me. Uh, <laughs> Cool. So let's uh, let's get started. And the uh, you know I have to have a nice like uh, hook in here. I have three easy steps. But just to be upfront with you, I'm totally lying. There are no three easy steps. Uh, it's just uh, every talk I think has to have three steps. So I'm going to try. I'm going to try though. <laughs> so who's heard of small functions or single purpose or tiny functions or? It's a thing, yeah, yeah, hey, I see some hands, nice. Um, who, who knows what that actually means? Like, how small is the right level of small? Uh, let, me, let me give you a hint. You can do it on one hand. Show me, show me the right number. <laughs> so the right number of lines of code I aim for is one or two lines. And, and again, I'm, I'm not just giving you some arbitrary thing to aim for. And, this is something that a lot of other people that are far smarter than I have, uh, have commented on. Uh, here's Martin Fowler's comment uh, on his Ruby code in this case. He says, half of my methods are just one or two lines long. 93% are under 10. So it's just one or two lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you get paid by weight or by volume? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, here, <laughs> so here my, my, my comment is, uh, when I've pointed this out it, uh, to various clients, they ask, well, you must be getting paid by the hour or paid by the line. This is nonsense. Who, who can make an app out of single line functions? Madness. Well, the, what gets lost in the details there is not that the goal is to just get single line functions for the purpose of single line functions. The purpose is to prioritize readability. So the purpose is to prioritize maintainability uh, so that when you're looking back at your code, you don't just see a, uh, a method that says array.length equals zero and you have to think, oh, that, that meant is empty. But you could have wrote a helper function that says, Hey, is users.empty? Oh, okay, well, we got to load our users now. That reads a lot better to the human brain. I know like a lot of programmers that are hardcore will be like, ah, I'm too good for that nonsense. But it's, it's about writing code for people, people and, and your future self. And this is usually you often lie to yourself and say, no, 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 I get this. I'll get this when I get back to it. But the thing is, whenever I come back to my old code, I, I hate to admit it, but I, I accuse some other person of writing it and, <laughs> and curse the heavens at their name. And then I do the git blame and god damn it, it was me. <laughs> uh, taking them out alone. So, you know, and, and some of the other, uh, before I go on, I want to cover some of these uh, reactions that I often hear, which are, you know, these, these quick quips that are you know, to shoot down the single line dogma. And these are, we see here, so you prefer books with a single line on each page. It's cute, but that's not the point. 
The point is readability, maintainability, and you want to assign purpose via your function's names to what the logic is. It's far easier to understand. Your brain can understand a function with a clear name rather than reading the whole function every time you need to digest it. That's a lot of tax. It's a lot of effort. And uh, it's something you just want to, I find it a lot easier to, when you're refactoring, just as a simple rule, make smaller functions. Right off out of the gate, you got 50% of your refactoring job done. So the next thing I wanted to introduce is this crazy idea that dry is overrated. So who, who's heard of this dry concept? It's really popular. Uh, don't repeat yourself. Sounds like a really good bit of advice. So, you know, that's, but people who apply it with a religious fervor of, hey, I'm only going to apply this code or I'm only going to refactor this code or extract this logic into a function only if it, only if it gets called two or three times. Why? The reason we want to create small functions is to assign groups of logic that with a name that's friendly, that tells the, the coder what on earth is the intent, what it's supposed to be doing. So this getting obsessed about dry, you know, muddles, muddies the water, and you, you can't really see what I'd like to emphasize, which is read. It doesn't actually stand for anything. It just means make your damn code readable. So that's... Uh, <laughs> If you want to uh, send me a uh, direct message on Twitter, feel free to come up with some fancy acronym for it. But the emphasis is make your code readable. You know, don't repeat yourself as just you know, pearl-clutching nonsense. It's just <laughs> so <laughs> cool. So those are like the two main overarching ideas, this, uh, that making tiny functions that assign meaning to your logic, and also don't obsess about dry uh, how dry your code is or how many times you repeat yourself. So I want to get into the, some specifics on how do, how do these high-level ideas apply or change your code? How do they make things better? And like always, the devil's in the details. So how do I do the thing? How do I make this refactoring thing happen? So I wanted to cover some example functions or some example scenarios and some code and just do some quick pointers on what's What's the deal here? What's going on? So you can see I've written a little uh, bit of code that says bad math and good math. Just take a minute to soak that in. I hope everyone over there can see right. So this may seem like a silly example, but I can assure you I see code like this written all the time. The code on the left, you may not write an add method like this but I guarantee you, you've written classes or objects just like this. The thing is, now this gets to purity, you know, writing pure functions. I really didn't want to make this a uh, functional and FP talk and get into that, <laughs> uh, that word game. Uh, but this is, the emphasis is if you write your functions so that they take the arguments they need and they return the next meaningful value, you'll end up with much more readable results. It's a lot easier to understand the, the code on the right where my add method accepts an x and y and returns a product or returns a result. Simple. This uh, code on the left does the same thing, uh, but not quite. Our add method here doesn't take any arguments. It relies on this. And as, as React devs, I know you may be quite fond of this. <laughs> Punch. So I'm going to try not to uh, throw too much shade at it. It has its place. But uh, OK, I lied. I'm going to throw some shade. Um, so avoid, why avoid this? Uh, I'm going to try to resist mentioning side effects, anything like that. This is a great way to hide, uh, create these like wormholes in your class where data can come through, and it could be in different states every time you call your function. That has a place. But it also makes your code a lot harder to understand. It makes it harder to understand when, a, when it goes wrong. So when you're reading it, you've now got to ask the question, well, what state was this dot state dot blah in and this dot state dot foo in when this error happened? It, you, you've got to like wind back several more layers. And if you just had a function that accepted the arguments it worked with and returned something useful. 
And as long as those, those values can be passed in every time, you may think, okay, well, like it's, uh, as long as those things can get passed in every time, you've got a much easier bit of code to process. Uh, at least for, for my brain, it's a lot easier to make sense of things when I just see what this function accepts. So even an a, a method name like add becomes a lot easier to understand if I know that there's no other side effects, no other variables at play. I don't have to trace up 100 lines up to the top of the file to see what other const are being defined and then scroll back down and I've got a terrible working memory, uh, like uh, <laughs> Scott was saying, uh, by the time I scroll 100 lines, I forgot what I'm doing. So, you know, it's just not worth the effort. <laughs> so, <laughs> please don't tweet me yet for name things good. Uh, <laughs> I already got pointed out, you know, that's not correct. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea is, it, what Martin Fowler was talking about in that tweet that I, I started off with was assigning meaning, giving your code the function names that tell you what it's doing, why. Like, if I, so I wrote this function here, inflate score, and the reason is, hey, this, this game I've got clearly has data that has fractions for my scores, and uh, that quite honestly didn't excite the users of our game console. We got the stats back, User reviews were like, wait, I only got a 0.5? I feel depressed. So you make it, hey, easy. You get a user story back, and now I've just got to adjust those scores. Make them, hey, 500. Hey, now I don't feel like such a failure uh, as my, at my arcade game. So this is how things typically get assigned as a business, uh, or as a, uh, as a story, or a ticket you'll get this thing saying, hey, make, this, make the scores more friendly to the users. Now, what I chose to do was give, give it some meaning. I called it inflate score, because that's what I'm doing in context. I'm not, I could have called this multiply by a thousand, but that, <laughs> and thought, great, I'll put it in my utils.js file. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but the point is that by giving it a one or two word concise description of what it's doing and what its purpose is. I've now made it so that this code is more readable. When I come back to see this later, I'm not gonna wonder where did that 500 score come from? You know, we only store fractions. What on earth's going on? I'll be like, oh right, we've got that thing where we inflate the scores so that they're user friendly. Got it, cool. And I'm not gonna go, because if it was just a pile of math in here, that doesn't pop out. So the point is not just making arbitrary one-liners. Make a one-liner that gives your code meaning, makes it read like a story. So that, that brings me to the next uh, piece. This is where this kind of gets into some more, um, uh, more of my uh, stronger opinions that, you know, you don't, you don't have to apply in all cases, and I certainly don't. Uh, but they definitely will, and again, all these ideas, you know, you, you pick and mix which ones you can use in the situation. Not all of these apply in all situations. That's, that's fine. You know, if you just pick one or two of these things, each refactor or each code review, you'll be in great shape. Uh, but here, so I say return early, not often. And that's about one, if you start out a function saying return, you know that anything else after that, you don't really have to worry about because this is all basically one expression. It takes the cognitive load off. And I'd say this is a one-liner, basically. So you can kind of fudge the numbers when you say, it's a, is that a one-line function? Well, if you've got a giant data structure, I'm not gonna count the data structure as lines of code. That's, that's just data structure, that's not instruction. So here we're doing an Ajax post. Uh, I'm pulling in, I'm using some destructuring, which is, if you haven't seen it, that's how I've got my curly braces, ID, username, and email in my update user argue, uh, function signature there. That will, that's a nice way to just declare the function so that you just see, right in the first two lines, you get a great deal of info. You know what's going on in here, and you can just trust that, oh, this is gonna update the user. I see it's doing the Ajax bit, and oh, cool, if I care to read on, I can see it gives me these standard messages. But I don't have the load of having to, you know, there's, there's no bits of like validation, there's no mix-ins, there's a place for that. But in here, I'm returning early, and it makes it easier process. I can make a lot of assumptions about the code 
And if you're familiar with generators, this is the complete opposite of that. So you can probably guess how I feel about those. Um, cool, so I wanted to really uh, hammer in this uh, point on destructuring. Who's used destructuring in JavaScript? Oh, that's so great. This, that, that was like three hands up like two years ago. It's one of my favorite features. ES6 had a lot of great features. Destructuring is easily, easily one of my favorites. Uh, coming from uh, other languages that do have it, I was familiar with it, liked it. I didn't realize how much I'd love it. It is, it's transformed how I make code more readable. It's not just about saving a few lines here and there. It's about surfacing the meaning, surfacing the arguments that your functions take. So our update user method here, this is the method that we just, I just showed you on my previous slide here. So when people say, uh, Dan, why do you use this destructuring thing for your function arguments? It helps you know what's on, it helps you define explicitly the keys on either side of the equation. So when you're looking at the source, you know what it takes. And then on the other side, you've got a, a two cool things. One, you get some repetition so that when you're looking at ID there, oh shoot, we use MongoDB. That needs to be an underscore ID. Okay, well that's gonna be repeated over and over and over if that's the case. If not, it's gonna stand out like a sore thumb if suddenly you just drop in a regular ID like that. So it's not the, the religious fervor over don't repeat yourself misses the point. Repeat yourself in ways that improve the meaning and help others understand what you're doing. So when people are on the other side maybe not familiar with your API, when they're calling update user, Sure, they're, up, they're repeating the key names. ID, username, email. Cool, uh, thanks Dan, that's really not dry. Uh, but hey, you know what? It, it reduces the cognitive time it takes to learn something. You can really easily get a feel for APIs and also your API decisions that change over time will become more obvious if they're too different. If your API suddenly was using username or you know, e, E underscore mail, don't do that. Uh, if you're using some other like naming convention for fields, that would uh, suddenly show up because it shows up in the implementation and your source. Because if you only change things and stuff gets updated in your API layer and it gets pushed to production and then you've got a separate code base that actually does the implementations, they may drift apart over time. Doing, using this destructuring pattern prevents that drift kind of put some boundaries there. So it has a lot of like long, ongoing effects that help improve the consistency of your code base. So I may change my consistency between code bases, but it makes me stick to, uh, within one code base, I, it's like nails on a chalkboard if you start seeing these diverging patterns or you know, user capital N name. You're like, no, that's not how it's done. And so now that I got that out of the way, I'm just gonna backtrack a little and say, well, what if I really don't want to retype those names over and over, and I just know that my objects are shaped right? Who's used spread? This is awesome. So right here, all I'm doing is taking the keys out of form, and I'm smashing them into this new object for update users' arguments. So my form object contains my keys. As long as it's got an email and username, those will get smashed in, and update user will get those. <laughs> uh, yes, it does matter where I put that spread, um, but there wasn't an idea in my previous example. <laughs> uh, rabbit hole, I will not get sucked into at this point. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yes, so if ever you're wondering where your key went, or, you, know, you can swap the order of where the spread operator is in there. It kind of runs in sequence. Uh, <laughs> cool. So we went through some of those key high level ideas and we kind of got in deep into the weeds on just how to design a function at a, uh, with some really specific rules that, that I uh, chose to apply. Now let's kind of flip that around and say how do we, how do, we do code review with this uh, view of how to win reviews and influence senior devs? <laughs> I see some Dale Carnegie fans in the hall. 
So the idea is these are really some key actions. I wanted to include all this text in the slide. If you're, if you're one of my students here, don't ever write a slide with this much text. But, <laughs> but this is important. So if you are a, if you're going to go ahead and do code review on a project that, you know, you've got uh, some senior devs you look up to, the key thing is to ask questions about what the code's doing. If you're asking questions about what it's doing and how it's structured, you'll find that it naturally flows into itself where, oh, you wrote these 18 uh, lines here that actually deal with three different logical steps. So you're doing a bit of validation here. Okay, you're hashing a password, and, and here you do a login look or user lookup. Okay, cool. Uh, but asking, identifying those, putting in a pull request comment, and asking, hey, uh, are small functions right for you? You know, that's a great way to get the a senior dev to start. You know, you never want to go and say, hey, this is how to write it, dumbass. You know, I, I may have been guilty of that at, at times, but the way to do this is just to ask questions. To make, when you show that you care enough about the code to think about it, that's part of what being a senior is. The other part is being a team member that's actually com com comfortable, confident enough to review other people's code and give them quality feedback. That is a hallmark of being a senior developer. If you can communicate and tell people what cross boundaries, hey, this is what I like, why are we doing this, what's going on here, help me out. Uh, talking, having that frank discussion is a, really, is a really incredible skill to set you apart. Your managers will always pick up on that and say, ha, this, this person's got a future here. And so I've got, in a, and you can, use, you can drop lingo. Uh, I, I'd recommend avoid saying things like, you know, pure functions and stuff, because, you know, that gets into a debate. There's smart people like Kyle Simpson who pointed out how purity may be like an impossibility. Uh, I will let them get on the philosophy side of that. Uh, I just want to focus on the simplicity of it. Suggest simple solutions. You don't have to drop the jargon but focus on, hey, do we need to have this uh, 20, 30 line function with all these variables just maybe defined midway? That's kind of hard to digest. And you know, I, I mentioned this count pathways. Cyclomatic complexity, did I lose everyone? <laughs> Got one hand, cool. So yeah, that's a proof that the jargon doesn't always work. <laughs> so avoid it, but what I'm referring to is this idea that your code's number of pathways, the number of ways it can exit or throw an error, return, maybe the amount of if branches, all of those add up and sure, you can do a lot of pathways in like 10 lines of code. Uh, that's, that's not the goal. Uh, but showing someone, hey, I had trouble reading your code, it looks like there's four, at least four places we could error and four return statements and possibly an error console log that doesn't actually error after it, so could it continue? And you can ask these questions and make someone who's a senior dev say, oh man, I totally forgot, like I, yeah, that error needs to stop the code dead, but yeah, it just kept going and printed out to console, yeah, good catch. So picking up on those small things will show you care about the quality, you pay attention to details. That stuff really comes through and is, again, just really sets you apart on, on your team. Uh, <laughs> And it, you'd be amazed, I put the second point in here because the amount of time that you can, the amount of time I've saved myself just looking for three word variables and pull requests just to give feedback like, is this really, does this describe the thing appropriately or is this in the right spot? I almost can do that without thinking or reading the code. Chances are it makes the person who wrote it go, oh yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, that needs to go somewhere else. Like, maybe not 90%, 80%, it's often. Because when you're just hacking it out and you find yourself writing really descriptive variable names, you probably need them in somewhere else or a different function, or that's the opportunity to break them up into s smaller functions. Creating run-on sentences as variable names is, again, not the goal. And then third, uh, you can just go straight to upgrade to senior developer, because you win at refactoring. Cool, I'm Dan Levy. I'm a JavaScript over enthusiast, and I'm an instructor at Galvanize, and I uh, do things on GitHub and the open source. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and check out my new library, fpromises.io. 
It's super awesome. It could use the stars. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Oh yeah, no, so definitely burn it down. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying uh, that it's okay to be repetitive. Definitely don't repeat yourself. But the idea of oh, if I'm not repeating myself, I've got a twenty line function. Do I need to re break this up? I'm saying yeah, go ahead and refactor it. But also, yeah, don't, if you find you've copied this Ajax call that has all these header manipulations and sets authorization stuff, and I've seen that before where it get, that kind of a thing will get copied in 50 different Angular components. Yeah. And it's like, no, stop. <laughs> yeah, don't. So no, definitely make that into a service or whatever pattern or create a React module. Make it, a, in, like, so follow good conventions there. I'm not saying dry is bad. I'm just saying that th this idea that oh, only extract if it's repeated is where people like, you're wasting time, just extract the logic so you can then when you go back to it, you can focus on, okay, so, because I often see the example is validation code. So validation code is thrown at the top of methods all the time and overlooked. And what happens is validation will change over time as business requirements change. Oh, make my password, no, that needs to be eight character minimum. Okay, well, let's change it on the server side, but the client side forgot to change it. Oh, well, we don't have a test for that because it was all in this like giant like 30 line function and you know, and we just got lazy and didn't write the test. But if you just have a validate like off method that takes the arguments and says, hey, username, password, and you just have a discrete test that says password needs to be longer than eight or greater than or uh, equal to, that makes it a lot easier to reason about as well. You can actually just look at that and say what it's doing without the extra baggage of the database or the fetch call or whatever else is going on, you don't, or the UI updates, when all that stuff's thrown together, it has a tendency to just get overlooked. So, oh. so you're saying you should just dry, not so much don't use dry, but uh, don't only use it when you're trying to start copying the code to places. Use it also to create the utility that you're going to use for next to your normal application. Yeah, so even if something just exists once, and if something like off, a super important part of your code, should probably only exist once. But still, break it out into little, little tiny functions that are a lot easier to put together like Legos. So that's, that's kind of the emphasis. So it's uh, when you've run out of uh, obviously repetitive code to refactor out, definitely the next step is, hey, can this be improved more? Can I enhance the readability? Any other questions? it's so much easier. So the thing is, I, I dropped a few slides about decoupling. Um, I probably shouldn't have. They were, uh, I had a really good joke too. It's like decoupling. <laughs> if you haven't heard, it's this great new drama on NBC. And uh, <laughs> no, it's, um, so decoupling is about taking the bits of code that are all entangled about the, that are, essentially doing multiple different things. Yeah, sure, we often will write out code the first time, weave it together, make it just work. Uh, Scott pointed out, just get small wins. Just code it out, get the thing working, then you've got to refactor. At some point, you're gonna deal with code that you're like, whoa, I, I am no longer even getting small wins. These are dirty deeds done dirt cheap, and this is not good. And, um, <laughs> And so the, the idea is these techniques play really well into testing. Um, so that when you are basically extracting these functions, you're decoupling your code. That's the net effect. And then when you take those out, like my example for validate args or verify off, you know, checking username and password, 
guess what? We just extracted something that was previously tied to a fetch call. Now it just deals with strings. I can copy paste that into my REPL. I can copy paste that in, into anywhere to test it. It has a very low friction, uh, like the lowest friction to test. There's nothing to even mock or inject. It is testable. I can, I mean, I wouldn't trust my brain to test it. I put it in the REPL and easily test it. I can see what comes out. If I put in an empty password, does it give me the right error? You know, those kinds of things, uh, when you've got just giant blocks of code, sure, you can write those tests and say you've got all the coverage for all the inputs. Uh, but as those change over time, it's easy to miss things. But when you've got granular code and granular functions, it becomes a lot more obvious that, hey, this, this pattern or this uh, given username, password, combo, was that failing in my fetch call? Was it failing in my validation? Where, you, you know, you, you end up making it a lot easier to fix the bugs as well. So when a, you can throw that to a junior, even though it's, oh, in the critical auth path, you know, you're just dealing with simple string manipulation. Simple string check. Exactly, and the cool thing you'll notice is when you actually start writing tests for code like this, your, your test code is gonna look a lot like the implementation of your real life code. Your tests aren't gonna be some weird, perverted version of, the, of your like, actual implementation. Like too, too much of the time I find code that has mocks upon mocks on like just layers of fake code and it's like, you look at the test and you're like, this can't be how it's used. And it's not how it's used, <laughs> it's just, Someone was tasked with getting 100% coverage, and they did. <laughs> so, like that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's a great, it's a huge loophole that people will, will just ignore. That say, hey, uh, my test code's in this total uh, bizarro universe, and it works nothing like regular code. That's okay. I'm uh, saying no. If if you focus on code like the right hand side here, your test code is gonna be, you know, your, your consts are right there. You just test the output. Like it's a really simple and direct way to see what's going on. And the, the other thing that's vulnerable, on the, uh, the other thing that your code is vulnerable to on the left side is something called a, a temporal bugs. That if the sequence of things isn't called exactly in the right order every time, well, when you call the function, you know, this is kind of where get using this is really dodgy. You don't know what state this was in. Um, that can be, you know, bad maths are context there. But if uh, X wasn't initialized, I'd probably get NAN or you know, some other weird uh, JavaScript result for that. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, when you're getting those errors that are deep in your code, it's super hard to understand like the state if it's being tracked through it. You know, I imagine that code on the left is like, you know, tracking mud throughout the house and trying to like wheel it back. You know, it's really, it's a lot harder than just, you know, not doing that. <laughs> so, cool. Uh, let me, I can drone on for that, on that stuff for a while, but the benefits to your tests are immense when they just are dealing with smaller and smaller logical blocks of code. Uh, did I see another hand? Yeah. Exactly. And especially if you're not using types, then, then it gets really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now you're going to get, hey, it's properly not defined, you can't find in production and actually do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's exactly, so like, I, I know there's some TypeScript fans uh, out there. And, you know, it's, uh, TypeScript will help prevent you from, like, just making, uh, you know, it, it kind of protects you from some foot guns. 
that you can you can avoid. But my argument is we don't need to add this whole layer on top of JavaScript. I don't need this whole like Javaification of JavaScript to get these benefits of reliability. If I stick to some simple rules that kind of just give me some uh, you know some barriers that my car just stays kind of in the road, I can you know go to sleep, put my Tesla in, in autopilot, and uh, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, bad example. Uh, but so the, the point is like you can, by following just simple rules that are almost, uh, and this isn't like some dogmatic thing, you may have seen the thing about destructuring. Well, it doesn't make sense to destructure an add method with x and y. Who's gonna think of named arguments x and y? What if they were a and b or you know, a and z? Whatever, I don't wanna have to, th there's certain cases where it makes sense and certain cases where it doesn't. So, but just following the rules of, and in putting consistency in your code base and readability above most other things, you end up getting a lot more, uh, you avoid a lot of the problems that will come from, hey, I had this uh, user list that was an array, now it's this object key uh, structure. Uh, how do I handle that? Oh, well, you probably wanna handle that uh, with quite a lot of deliberate tests and uh, that use case sounds really like a bad direction to move in, but <laughs> such are business requirements. So, you know, but sticking with these simple rules that just make simple functions, and of course, you know, you can use destructuring to have a thousand arguments being passed in. Don't do that, that's also a terrible idea. You've just now swapped one problem for, okay, now you've got to repeat your keys on both sides of the equation, and that, that's not that great. So like that also means you're probably not doing single purpose. You're probably bleeding over into multiple, uh, your function's probably doing 20 things if you're passing that many arguments in. Um, cool, let me uh, see, Is it, were there any other questions? Is there a compelling trade-off to doing the timing of functions? Like you gave us some very quickie, fancy examples, if you will. Mm -hmm. is, is there like a, something that you can meet that you um, yeah, so uh, I did have some open source projects that I, I wanted to look at their code, but I figured it was probably in poor form to go pick on <coughs> Axios. And, uh, <laughs> but no, like it's, it's very common to see like their HTTP response handler is a promise constructor function that spans almost 200 lines. Every few lines, there's a, there's a comment that says, oh, set up this error handler. Next few lines, set up this abort handler. Well, guess what? Those kind, that sort of thing I see all the time in a file that's hundreds of lines. I mean, I'm sure you've seen those, that sort of pattern where people would be like, I don't do comments, but I just add them where needed. I, I'm a comment minimalist. And, <laughs> and that's, that's cool and all, but those are probably points where you should break those out and make a little function. Make this a durable, repeatable set. Uh, the benefits are that you, it's hard, like, I, I mean, if you can handle reading a 200 line function that deals with, that wrap, has a promise that wraps over event handlers, uh, a cancellation state, a, uh, like, option and input argument munging, uh, if you can process that every time, uh, you're a far better programmer than me, and I just, you know, I hope I don't have to work on your code, but, uh, <laughs> uh It grows in. And because of the complex control flow, it's terrified Yes, yeah, so that's exactly what, how this stuff grows. Yeah, so I'm sure Axios developers didn't go one day and they're like, I'm gonna write a 200 line, just pile of steaming mess, this artisanal JavaScript that'll be devilishly complex and no one will get. No, that's not how they wrote it. Uh, it gets wrote with every issue and every pull request and it's uh, smashed together like a ball of mud. Uh, and that sort of thing gets uh, pulled together. And if you don't make time to refactor and actually deliberately improve the code quality, and in a very specific way, you're, it's not gonna happen. The, the next time you look, it may be a 300 line function. It's not gonna improve, and the person who's actually working on the bug fixes for that, they're gonna have a hell of a time trying to actually make it work. And you better hope they've got damn good test coverage because there are, when you're counting code pathways there, there are many. 
And in their code, I could see uh, easily, you know, errors could be called multiple times, which promises don't support, but they were in their mixing event patterns with promises, and hey, it just works as is, so let's not touch it. And the reason I didn't bring it up was it would actually be really difficult to refactor that with making any assumptions because of how they mix their patterns together. So it's not always easy, but the longer you let it fester, it's definitely gonna be that much harder. So it's, yeah, sure, there's big projects that make that stuff work, and I've certainly made good money writing terrible code like that. It's certainly possible. But at the same time, I don't wanna hate my previous self and just wonder why I was such a terrible developer. He's got a new a new version that's just JavaScript, which oh, nice. yeah, it just came out like a month ago. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah, and it is a great book. Martin Fowler's book is yeah, his original refactoring book, and the new one highly recommended. They just go on and on and on about a million things, and I found it when I first read them. I was like, well, what do I do next? Like I was looking at code, and I'm just like, well, how do I do this? <laughs> I mean, I felt a lot smarter, but I don't know if I could actually do anything with it. Um, so it, I wanted to focus on trying to just give you some quick pointers that will hopefully be actionable. Uh, cool, do we have any other questions? No? Awesome, cool. let's give Dan a round of applause. Thank you. Cool, thanks Dan. Yeah, thanks to uh, both Scott and Dan. Um, along the lines of speakers, we are always looking for new speakers. So uh, huge props to them for stepping up and, and giving talks tonight. Uh, we're always looking for new ideas, whether it's React focused or not. Um, so please, if you have an idea, come talk to me. Otherwise, I may be giving a talk next month, which you may or may not want to hear. Um, <laughs> So uh, with that, I just want to thank you all for coming out. Thanks to our volunteers, uh, Josh and Kevin. Kevin was here earlier. Yeah, please do give them a round of applause. Uh, they've been extremely helpful. Um, and with that, I'll wish you all a good night, and uh, thanks again. <laughs>